I want to ask you this because I, I know uh, I felt like you were throwing a little shade my way. Okay, okay, with let's the, go, um, baby. Come on, let's get it. With the with the Piotr Jan situation. Oh yes, 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 yes. But D DJ, what do you think about Aljo when he was when he was uh, calling you out a little bit? What was uh, going through your mind when when Aljo? <laughs> I loved Aljo it. Talking that game. I loved it. I loved it. So Aljo, are you are you right now saying your next fight is going to be at 145? You think officially? That's Sean O'Malley and Cheeto. We're gonna see that in March. Aljo, what are your thoughts on that matchup? This is how I feel about it. Johnson, you're listening to the Body Cast. So now I'd, I'm going to count down one, two, three, and then clap, and we'll all clap. Three, two, one, clap. <laughs> wait, wait. <laughs> that was terrible. That was terrible. <laughs> What is going on, ladies and gentlemen? Welcome back to another episode of The Mighty Cast. Me as your host. Uh, I don't like always say it's my host. I like to say me and Michael are your hosts. And our special guest today, he needs no introduction. He is the former Benaway Chairman of the World. They call him Funk Master. Welcome, Aljame Sterling, the Funk Master. What up, people? What up, people? Thank you, thank you. Now, it's really brilliant, people. Huge. This is a huge opportunity. Huge. <laughs> You <laughs> It's my Donald uh, Trump. <laughs> now, Aljo, thank you so much for coming on the uh, podcast. Give us the time to hang out and chat. Uh, man, how you been? What's going on in life? You know, what's good? I'm back trying to get my get my feet back under me. Every time I'm I'm starting to train and stopping to train, starting to train, then I got to go do some like work events and stuff like that. Um, so now I kind of, I got my testing out the way at the UCPI. Um, they got to compare my numbers to the bantamweights, to the featherweights. And now I'm back in Vegas after the holidays. Did a little good eating, you know, trying to, you know, we're going up a weight class. So I had to, had to make sure I got my, my servings of plates. Mm. So now we're ready to go back in Vegas, man. We're about to start training again. Mm, that's what's up. Now you say you're going up a weight class. I know when we met each other in Vegas, what was like two, two months ago, I think it was in uh, August. And you were talking about how hard it is to make 135. But you, out of all the athletes that make a huge weight cut, you've never missed weight. You have never missed weight. And now you're going up to 145. Now, how do you feel about going to 145? And do you think it's going to, obviously, it's going to, I don't need to think. I know it's going to be easier in your body. How do you feel that you will fare against 145ers? Because they're about as big as you. Because I don't I mean, Max, I think he gets to like 175, 180 maybe. And you get up to about what? one The same, correct? Yeah. I mean, I've been 180. I've been a little Jesus heavier than Christ. 180. <laughs> but not, it's, not a, it's not a good, healthy 180. But um, I could get up there. Um, like feel good like right where I'm at right now I'm about 70 71 and I think that's a good healthy weight for me I'm not fat I, I got some abs going you know so I don't even know how I don't know how I've ever made it and then I don't know how I've made it for so long I mean once upon a time like wrestling season I could take a short notice fight as an amateur and early pro and I could take a fight on one week's notice and make the weight no problem now Dude, I need I need that eight weeks. That that eight weeks is a scientific approach on how to destroy my muscles so that I can break down um, and get to the weight class. And like I said, I did the testing, and uh, my numbers came back that I'm 26.7% over the weight class limit in comparison to all the other band weights. Which, I mean, I make the weight, dude. Like at the end of the day, I make the weight. People can say whatever they want. Um, this was the only way I've ever known how to compete from wrestling to college wrestling to now MMA. And uh, it, it's not easy, but I always get it done. Yeah. Now you're talking about this testing. What is this testing? You doing vertical jump, you do 40 yard dash. You know, is this like, you know, the NFL combine? Like, what type of testing are you doing at the, you know, the PI to measure against the banner weights, the feather weights? Like, what exactly is this testing you're talking about? I've never, I never heard of this. You have, you have my interest now. Um, I was gonna make a joke, but I'm just getting right to it. So, <laughs> <laughs> I was trying to, I was trying to spit it in my head. I was like, you know what? Let's let's leave that one out. We'll no, no, take that one fuck, out the book. No, do do what you want. Do the jokes. I love it because it's it's good. I mean, our viewers love everything, you know. And you've always been an amazing personality. I don't know how people hate on you 
Like you're a good guy, you live an honest life, you never really bad mouth anybody. I understand you're trying to sell fights or whatnot, but for the most part, you're a, you know a cool ass cat. So don't you know you got jokes, say the jokes. I I love to hear them. <laughs> all right, all right. Um, <clears throat> so for this, I came in, but I let them know like I've been on a a bender since the fight. Like just this is all I wanted to do: have a vacation after I beat my, uh, Henry Cejudo, took that fight. I was like, I'm going on vacation. Then a couple hours later, I'm in the back room. I hear Dana White talking about that. We're going to turn him around for August. And I'm just scratching my head like, Bart? So when I finally <laughs> get my vacation, um, I left no stones unturned. I, I, I went hard, man. I, I partied. I mean, I didn't get like blackout drunk every single night type of thing. That's not what I do. But I get to enjoy my drinks. I can stop training, let my body heal up. So I told them, you know, listen, I haven't really trained. I trained for fun. I was in Bali. Yeah, I would go train in the morning. Then I would pretty much go to the beach, get drunk, do some surfing, and then rinse and repeat the next day. <laughs> um, so so <laughs> I, I was just trying to let them know ahead of time, like these numbers might not reflect where I'm really supposed to be at. So just keep that in mind when we're doing these numbers and the calculations. Um, first day I came in, we checked my weight. Uh, we did some strength stuff, some punch um, on the bars, some like deadlifts, stationary deadlifts things that we had to do. And then we did some box jumps with weight, seeing how fast you could drive force from the ground um, with versus speed to like give you the power and f something like that. Some mm -hmm. metric that they use. And we did that on the first day. And then I did a, a bicycle thing where it was like a six second sprint all out max. I'm like, I wish they kind of told me this so I could kind of like start running a little bit or maybe cycle a bit. Six second sprint. I think it was six reps and they measured that with everything else. And then the next day we did like some PT. Well, not really PT. It was more like um, an orthopedic evaluation, checking all my body parts, range of motion, mobility, um, all that good stuff. Um, we did some other sit-down stuff from a nutrition standpoint. They did a DEXA scan on my entire body. And then the last day, we did the other part of the cardiovascular testing, which was like a... Um, I think we did... We actually did two on the on Monday. We did the six-second interview, and then we did a one-minute all-out for as long as you could go, how long you could sustain that for, and then seeing how fast you could recover after it was done. So that was just one rep, but the other one was six reps of six-second sprints. And then the Wednesday, the last exercise we did was uh, a static climb. I don't even know if that's the correct term, but we did a, a, a gradual climb, 40 RPMs, 45, 50 RPMs. Each one was for about a minute, keeping that same pace for about a minute, I think it was. And then I might be botching this, but I think it was like 30 seconds to a minute, but I think I'm going to say it was a minute. And then I got all the way up to 80 before I pretty much crapped out. And that was pretty much all the testing that we did. And then they put it all in the system, come back, and we had like a whole meeting, sit down, and just evaluate the numbers. Because obviously the fight's the fight, psychological. Yeah, oh, yeah. Skill, skill technique. Like you can score as high as you want on those things. I don't really give a shit. It's whether or not you know how to fight. So, um, yeah. So I think um, based on the numbers that we've seen, my numbers were more than adequate enough to compete with 45ers. It's just going to be that mental aspect I'm going to have to get over because I'm used to always being one of the bigger guys at 35. And that's all I've ever known. Dude, my DEXA scan came back. The lowest weight that I should be going to, removing all fat, which is impossible, right? Yeah. 147.6 pounds. So for me to ever <laughs> get to band weight, it, it's just... When they told me that, I was like, there's just no way. Yeah. Like, how does that even make sense? There's no way I could damage that much muscle so I could get down to this weight class. That's when I thought about it, I was like, man, that's actually very detrimental, man. I, I you know, I mean, fasted training sessions I do sometimes sparring fasted because I need to make the weight, but I've always done it. It's like I said, it's the only thing I've ever known. And, and I always competed at a high level and I won. So I was like, well, if it ain't broke, don't fix it, right? Yeah. Or well, you've never, you never miss weight. You've always came through in your fights, never got injured, you know, like torn a bicep, broken a leg, broken an arm, or whatever it may be. And I think the biggest thing, you going down to 135 and doing that, I mean, obviously, you're already, sh I mean, you're pretty fit when you're like 170, 175 in training camp. You know, I follow you. And then when you get to 135, you just look god awful, like even more shredded. Like your muscle became more refined, I guess you can say. I think you going up to 145, it's going to, 
I think you're going to like it because when I was cutting 125, I absolutely hated it. Every bit of it. But I was so small. Like when I fought Domino Cruz, I was coming home from training camp, weighed 138. And then now when I fight for one championship, I can't cut to 125. I have to fight at 135 hydrated. And it's been literally the best thing like training wise, me keeping the muscle on, carbs, everything in training camp is so much better. So I think for you going to 145, I think it's going to be healthier because you're 34, 35 right now, right? 34, man. You're By the way, I did tear my bicep a oh. long time ago. Though. Well, 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 there you go. <laughs> and I know you've had some neck injuries. It's the same thing that happens to my professor in jiu-jitsu. Like when he, gets, when he starts cutting weight to get ready for big competition like Worlds or Pans, he always starts to get injured because, you know, you're putting your body in a deficit where you're used to be more carrying more water weight, more carbohydrates. I mean, you're working out fasted, so that's just putting your body in a, in, a, in a situation where it's basically lacking nutrients. Now, going to 145, the biggest thing I saw when you said that, you want to make your interest in the 145 a blessed one, which means you're calling out my boy Max Holloway. I like that matchup. I think it's a great matchup. Two different styles. Right, Max Holloway, more of a striker. You, more of a well-rounded, more wrestling, grappling base. I don't think he's never fought somebody who is a good, who is a wrestler, a good enough, a, a good as wrestler as you are. Right, like when I think about it, I mean, you look at his, you know, Alex, Alex Volkanovski, Jose Aldo, uh, Kava Qatar. Other than that, I can't think. A uh, Korean Zombie. Did he fight Korean Zombie? I don't know if he did or not. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He, just, he just beat him recently. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Your memory, is, your memory is horrible to me. What do you mean my memory is <laughs> horrible? I got, I just named five, four <laughs> dudes. You know what? I forgot he knocked them out. All the, all the way was just the, the <laughs> zombie Holloway was his last fight. Yeah. Great yeah, knockout, so. great retirement for zombie. And DJ's like, did he fight zombie? <laughs> what? That was so what? sad, what? man. That was a sad loss. That was yeah, it, it, that was a sad maybe one. maybe that's why DJ forgot it. He just doesn't want to. Yeah, yeah, he doesn't want to remember it. But I mean, he hasn't really fought somebody who's going to cross the distance and use the wrestling to your advantage. You know what I mean? Like everybody fought, tries to stand and bang with him. Not saying you to go out there and just wrestle him, but you know, we all know it's in the Funk Master sauce. We all know what it's there. How how do you feel about like? Do you think this is the fight they're going to give you? Are you angling for it? Like. Talk to me about like why why the blessed one. I'm definitely angling for it. Um, I mean, he fought Frankie Edgar, but I think Frankie was a little bit over the hill at that point. Um, that, I think that was his last title shot that he he had in his career. But uh, I like to think that I'm a little bit bigger than Frankie, and my uh, wrestling yeah. is a little bit more unique than you know him hitting the, the knee taps and stuff like that. Um, I, I think if I'm gonna go up, man, it's like why not shoot for the stars. And I, I think for me to go fight an up comer doesn't make a ton of sense. Because it's like, what does that do for me? What, how does that justify me getting a title shot even if I come in and I win one fight like that? I go in and I win one fight against a guy like Max Holloway. I mean, I, I don't think there's anybody else to turn to. That guy is the one who's literally banishing all the contenders one by one. So if he's going to keep dispatching these guys, here's some new blood. Here's a new face. He doesn't have anything to do right now. I don't have anything to do right now. So I think UFC 300 could be a, a fire card, come back for that, or um, maybe in March. Mm, yeah, and I think it. I think we're bar I think we're burying the lead a little bit here. So so Aljo, are you are you right now saying your next fight is going to be at 145? You think officially? That's I would say officially what I think I'm going to be at. Mm. I don't. It's not really a thing. I it's I, I we haven't had the conversation yet formally. But that's the decision that I want. So that's where I'm at right now. What's going on, guys? This podcast is sponsored by G Fuel. Now, ladies and gentlemen, we all know we love to have that extra energy when we hit the gym or when you are gaming. So do yourself a favor. Go to gfuel.com. And when you check out, make sure you use my promo code MIGHTY. And that will save you 20%. Now, G Fuel has all these amazing flavors. Mine is the Mega Man. I love the blueberry slushy. It's absolutely delicious. And the cool thing about G Fuel, it's not just all the caffeine. It's also the multivitamins in it that which gives you the opportunity to not have a crash after you come off of the energy that you get from the amazing product. Now, ladies and gentlemen, go to gfuel.com 
And when you check out, use my promo code MIGHTY to save 20%. And make it even easier for you guys, check the description. We made a link for you guys. Go there, click the link, promo code MIGHTY. Get yourself some G Fuel and get fueled. Ah. Well, I think at the end of the day, it's your, it's your decision ultimately. I mean, you can tell, you know, your boss, the UFC, whoever, whatever contract you're under or organization, what I mean, if you want to go 145, you should be able to go, shit, if you want to go 170, they might say, you know, Aljo, I don't think that's the best idea, but I think, you know, <laughs> you going 145, it shouldn't be an argument, right? Because what is there left Yo, for- they don't want these hands at 170, bro. They don't <laughs> want these hands at 170. I'm telling you right now, cuz, I'm telling you right now, cuz. I, I, I mean, you look at 135, <laughs> you beat, you beat uh, uh, Henry Cejudo, Henry's about to fight Marab, and I think when you're at 135, you have that, not a conflict of interest, but you want to see Marab eat. You want to see Marab have the opportunity to fight for a belt, where I think the UFC is more against that. They're like, no, we want to see you two fight because he's the number one contender, and you're probably number two contender. Why don't you guys fight? So I think you go up to 145 and give Marab an opportunity to fight, you know, to make his way to the title, right? Because if you do go back to 135, it'll just be you fighting, you know, Sugar Sean O'Malley, but that fight's already been made with him versus Chito Vera. So for you, it's like, yeah, why not? Why not shoot for the stars at 145? And it could use some fresh fresh blood. I know Illy is about to fight Alex Volkanovsky. If you get through Max, then you might be next in line for, you know, the title shot. So I think it's a smart, it's a smart move. Why not? You're 34. Shit. What you got to lose? You ain't got nothing to lose. So, but that's kind of cool. One forty-five, it is, huh? Hmm? That's it. I ain't got nothing to lose. Max Holloway, catch me outside. How about oh that? My God. How about that? <laughs> <laughs> oh my God! All right, let's. Uh, I want to uh, ask you about uh, your buddy Marab. How long you guys been training for? Like, what's that relationship like? Uh, we've been training with each other from about twenty, I think twenty thirteen. Damn, if I'm not mistaken. Um, before I got to the UFC, he was down there and I had just moved back home to Long Island from upstate New York where I was going to college. So as soon as I got my degree, I was like, all right, I'm out. I'm going to go back home because I could, I could kind of see where the gym was going. It was going more commercial and even that wasn't looking good. So I was like, I'm going to go where there's people that actually really are invested in the sport. I'm like, cause I, I don't have time to time to waste i'm trying to shit or get off the pot mm. while i'm still in my 20s i, I kind of knew exactly what i wanted to do and i went for it um so we've been friends for a very long time training partners for a very long time I remember when he first came in he wasn't he wasn't very technical man he was literally just a tasmanian devil and he just did not get tired but i would submit him over and over take him down because my wrestling was just a lot cleaner than him he was predominantly all judo mm. and oh, sure. um yeah, he had some really good throws and stuff like that, but for the most part, um, in the beginning, it was very one-sided, but I love that he just kept going and never stopped. And then we kind of slowly became each other's like main training partner. I show him stuff, he showed me stuff. I was teaching the MMA class, he was my main drill partner, uh, main partner that I would spar with, main partner that I would do my extra rounds with. So um, that's kind of how that friendship develop over the years mm. now he i believe his next fight i know it's not signed on the paper or anything like that his next fight is against triple c now you fighting triple c five rounds you beat him and you train with marab how do you think that fight is going to go down like what do you you know what do you think is going to happen i'm just saying man i, I thought he was double c now but if he wants to go back to just, just to see, if he wants to just go to see, hey, if you step in there with Marab, I'm telling you, you're gonna lose that last double, and it's gonna be just a single, man. I'm just, I'm just four one in Henry Cejudo. He's, I think he's overlooking this guy, and Piotr Jan did the same exact thing, calling him a zero um, during my vlog thing that I was doing, like my behind the scenes stuff, and then came back and bit him in the ass. So I'm like, you guys. Look at him and think like there's not much there, but when he stands in front of you, I'm telling you, it's it's different. It's different. Oh, dude, his gas tank. When I see him fight, and I didn't even talk to him, and I was like, dude, I was like, honestly, I think Marab's a harder fight than Aljo. And he goes, he goes, really? Why? And I was like, because his gas tank, like he doesn't stop. Like somebody who has 
the will or the drive to keep on coming forward, doesn't get tired, is not scared to cross distance, will exchange hands with you, who has pretty good wrestling, that's a harder fight. To where I feel like when you go, not saying Marab is not technical or uh, strategic about how he goes about it, he, Marab lives in the chaos a lot more than you do. You create the chaos, yes. but then you control it with your back taking, your body triangle, and flattening people out. Like you have a systematic way about doing it. Marab does too, but his is more chaotic. So I, I'm excited for that fight because I know, you know, I've trained with Henry. I know what he loves. I know he loves to play the distance and that borders and shit. And I'm like, dog, sometimes you just got to get after and go fight and he does that but there's things he did when you guys fought where I'm like you didn't take his back yeah Aljo shot and he felt that shot and you didn't take his back but I'm excited for that fight and I always wanted to get your your piece on that <laughs> to see what you think would be different when you know Marab and Henry lock horns but I love you and Marab's relationship um I saw you tweeted about how people have been showing that Kobe Covington and Jorge Masvidal relationship and how you know they end up fighting each other then they have a lawsuit against each other they're not i mean they were best friends at one point and now yeah, they're man. not and now you and marab you're like we're not gonna fight like there's more to money than there's more to friendship than fighting and making money so i i love that about you guys yeah and like i said for the few dollars that people want us to do it for it's just a joke it's just like i would never i would never um and and that video, man, that I felt that because I'm like, man, mm -hmm. I, I I know what that's like, you know. So to to lose a friend over some something like that, I've had some falling out with friends over some like stupid shit. So to see that storyline, how they piece it together, both of these guys in each other's corner, they zoom into his eyeball and then they see what Kobe's thinking, what's in his brain, and then they zoom into Masvidal's eyebrow, uh, uh, eyeball, and he's doing the same exact thing, and you see where he's got his back, but he's got his back, and then you see the animosity in the fights and everything. I'm just like, come on, man. Like, And it, it just, I just don't like to see things get bent out of shape like that, and I know there was some other stuff outside of the octagon and things like that, but regardless, they were good friends before that, no matter what anyone wants to say. So... I just could never put myself in that situation to to have a a nasty falling out like that. I just it's just not worth it for me. Yeah. Um but in regards to the fight, I mean I think you're right in that like Marab does not slow down and I think the difference between my style and his style, I've always said like I know obviously I cut a tremendous amount of weight, but I always make it and I always pride in myself on having one of the best gas tanks and I feel like around 2020 or 2019 is actually yeah 2019 with Pedro Munoz is when I started to feel like I was starting to slow down into the third round which mm. never re never really happened man like I, I was the guy who was screaming in between rounds like come on come on like hyped up ready to go I can do this all day <laughs> like Captain America literally like Captain America I could I could do this all day and after that fight I was like I know I had an insane output but I've done that in the training room. Why is that not translating into this? I know there's adrenaline. I know there's the crowd, the environment. But even so, in other fights, I feel like I've expended so much more energy in the grappling exchange that I get up and I'm just popped up and I'm ready to go. And I can keep jogging around like Clay, uh, Clay Guida. But then I think Marab's style, I think because he doesn't cut as much weight, yep. he's able to sustain that even in the training room and then even in his fights. To do that to someone like Piotr Jan, who has pretty solid takedown defense for 25 minutes bro that's, <laughs> that's what that, I mean <laughs> that is insane <clears throat> what does Henry really think he's gonna do I'm like bro you need to knock him out early because the longer the fight goes it's gonna favor Marab and if you get tired and you slow down and you end up on your knees <laughs> and you take a bad shot bro Marab's not gonna sit there and, and look at the ref and say hey why is he on his knees no he's gonna spin behind he's gonna punch you under your arms punch you over the arms in the tur same turtle position he had Marlon Marais in. And that's just what he does. He's literally just a Tasmanian devil. He doesn't stop. He's going to keep coming forward. And Henry might have better, cleaner technique when it's like hitting pads and whatnot or drilling. But when Mar someone who could put it together as chaotically as Marab, and I hate calling it chaotic because I feel like it kind of, it's a little disrespectful to what he's done. Like he has a science to his madness. Absolutely. But and he just he just keeps pressing buttons on the controller and somehow, some way he's gonna get you. <laughs> and yeah, I mean, I mean no disrespect. I love to live in the chaos. Like I feel when I get in the clinch and I can just see in a chaos when people outside and they watch me fight, 
you know, the, the audience or whoever, they're like, dude, this is chaos. But for me, I'm like, yeah, I like to create the chaos because I can fight in this chaos and I see the opportunities and the openings to be able to take advantage of my opponent. So we, I mean, no disrespect, Rob. Don't be coming after me. I know how you begin after people when they say stuff about you, but you know. <laughs> Switching gears a little bit. So we, we did mention it earlier and we, we talked about potentially we'll see uh, Henry and Rob, but another matchup that's already booked Sean O'Malley and Cheeto. We're going to see that in March. Aljo, what are your thoughts on that matchup? And obviously, they, they already had a fight mm -hmm. before. It's a little bit controversial, but what are you thinking about that fight, um, che Cheeto versus Sugar in March? This is how I feel about it. No, I'm joking. I'm joking. <laughs> 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 <I'm out. laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> I think I think it's a great fight, man. I, I, like, don't get me wrong. Like, although I am annoyed, I think the division is annoyed. <laughs> um, I know Marab is definitely annoyed. It's a great fight, still. It's just not the right fight to make right now. I mean, people could say whatever you want about the storyline. Okay, he's just trying to get paid. Like, yeah, I get that. That's not what I'm talking about. What I'm saying, based on merit, Marab was the next guy in line. O'Malley was the next guy in line to fight me. He goes, nah, I'm going to let Henry try to deal with those problems because if he could take out Aljo because he has wrestling, then I know I could take out Henry because of the size difference. That's a much easier fight that I have less to worry about. So he bowed out even though he was the number one contender. People were saying I blocked Marab. I didn't block Marab. If O'Malley took his title shot when he was supposed to and then Henry wanted to come back, then it would have been Henry and and Marab for a number one contender, and then it's a different situation. But that's not what happened. I fought Henry, and then I fought O'Malley, and now Marab's getting passed up for this matchup. And I'm not saying Cheeto's a bad guy. I like Cheeto. I think Cheeto's a cool dude. Um, I think he's kind of grown into this persona that he portrays now, like this Mr. Bad Boy, Mr. F*** it, f*** everything, I'm, I'm, I'm too cool. That kind of persona thing, whatever. Uh, and then you have this, the poodle still, it's um, it's an interesting matchup. I think it's, like I said, I think it's a good fight. I do think my one thing that I was hoping for to get to the later rounds was that O'Malley would get more tired before me, especially if I was able to put the, the wrestling weight on him a little bit. Unfortunately, I didn't get to, to see that because I felt like in the Jan fight, he was slowing down very visually. And I think a guy like Cheeto, you cannot do that against a guy who continuously gets stronger as the fight goes on. I know they talk about the first fight, one guy is saying that was fluky. Uh, he just tapped my leg and I fell over. Okay, that you could say that, but the fight was only like two minutes long. Yeah, there wasn't much that happened before that for us to go. Well, you were definitely winning O'Malley, so I feel like if you guys have a rematch, I gotta go with you. I think you. you he came out hot, throwing these bunch of kicks, trying to be bouncy, trying to throw kicks to the body, front kicks, legs, and then he's trying to get out of there. I think when he moves so much. It's going to get, get him tying a guy like Cheeto, who's very durable, keeps his hands up, slowly takes his little steps, takes a little bit of a bite. Mm. Every time he advances, takes a small bite and a smaller bite, and then he's cutting you off, and eventually he's able to find the mark and land one of those crazy kicks, one of those knees that he hit on Rob Font, or a big punch. And I think that's going to be the difference in this. It's not like Sean's going to wrestle him, right? So Corey was able to wrestle. Can O'Malley switch gears and say, you know what, I'm going to be able to implement wrestling and make him tired or win some rounds because if he does that like I said if he if what I what I believe to be true that O'Malley fades the longer the fight goes faster than Cheeto that's going to be a rough night if he decides to wrestle early and then he needs to sh see what that feels like in real time because he's always so used to striking playing basketball um and the only strikes with everybody else but when it comes to this is it's it's gonna be a little bit different. I I think people are counting out Cheeto because he's a slow starter. I'm not saying to that doesn't weigh anything, but I think in a five round fight, I like Cheeto's chances of winning better than I do Sean's. And that's no hate. That's just keeping it a buck. That's your analyst. That's that's you being an analyst. And I, I have to agree with you 100. percent I think that's the only thing that hurts Cheeto. Very, you know, when he fought Dom. Dom was. I mean, you look at it. Dom was winning that fight when they fought. Right, he's a slow yep. starter. Dom mixed it up, wrestling in him, out, out striking, not really hurting Cheeto, out striking him, and then you know Dom does his up and ducks into a kick, gets knocked out. Um, so Cheeto does start slow, and when he does start slow, if it's a five round fight like the fight is with Sugar Sean O'Malley, him, 
And what he does, he doesn't really overextend when he crosses distance. He walks across the distance. Like you said, he takes a little bite, a little bite, throws hands. I do believe Sean O'Malley does have it in his athletic ability to wrestle Chito Vera. He has a great coach, Tim Welch. I think he's a black belt in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. So it's going to be the interesting thing is how is Sugar Sean O'Malley going to deal with Chito Vera pressuring him? And how is yeah. Chito Vera going to deal with Sean O'Malley's output? Like, is he going to let Sean tee off on him? If Sean's like, okay, f*** it. I know he's a slow starter, so in these first two to three rounds, I got to bite down on my mouthpiece and make him, you know, try to knock him out. Or do you play the game where you're running around and trying to go uh, lateral and force him to overextend so you can knock him out? I mean, it's going to be interesting. But the first fight, if you look at all Sugar Sean O'Malley's fights, he's always had trouble when people kick his legs. Always, always, always. This is the first time he's had leg injuries. I mean, I can't remember the gentleman he fought who injured his leg, and I think he broke it, and like he was like, I love you. Andre Sukumta. Yeah, Andre uh, kicked his legs, almost could have finished the fight if he would have taken advantage of it, and then you have Chito Bear, <laughs> who did the exact same thing. So I think you, your analyst and your assessment is spot on. Thank you. Um, I know some people are going to say I'm just hating, nah. but it's it's not hate. It's This is what I see when I look at the fight, and uh, like I said, I think it's a great fight still. I just wish Cheeto, if Cheeto had won against Sanhagen, dude, I don't give a shit. Let Cheeto freaking fight. But the fact that he's number six, he just beat Pedro Munoz. If Pedro were to have beat him and I think it was split decision, would Pedro Munoz have gotten a title no, shot? No, no, you have to, you got to leave all that behind, my friend, because when I was a champion, I remember I fought Chris Curioso and Chris Curioso was on like fight, fight, win streak. I was like, this guy deserves a title shot. Nobody else in the division deserve a title shot. He's on a five fight win streak. I end up fighting him and then I end up fighting somebody else. I think it was John Dotson and he had like two fight win streak. It's all about the storyline nowadays, right? Like, yes, Cheeto and Sean have a storyline, but rightfully so right now, Marab is undefeated in the Benway division, right? He's on the longest winning, winning streak. So yes, technically he should be uh, fighting next for the title. But, you know, I, I just literally, me and Michael were talking about, uh, What's the gentleman's name? CM Punk. CM Punk versus Mike Jackson. My producer's like, oh, man, you, you got to break down CM Punk. You know, he's coming back to WWE. And later on, if you guys don't know who CM Punk is, he's a wrestler. He fought in mixed martial arts. His first time fighting in the UFC, he made $500,000. I have no reason why. I don't know who the hell convinced Dana White to sign that check. <laughs> and then he fought again. Fought Mike. J he fought Mickey Galley. Made another $500,000 for his second loss in mixed martial arts so it's all about a popularity contest so i would think but no, could, I, I'm, I'm with you bro yeah I'm, I'm with you on that i get it i'm just saying what's the point of no, rankings and, yeah no you're, you're f***ing right <laughs> that's that's all i'm saying i'm <laughs> yeah. not saying hey cheeto doesn't deserve it by any i'm just saying if we're going by the merit system what what is the point of him fighting piotr Jan and risking it all if you're not going to get the title shot after that but o'malley gets it and then he gets to wait <laughs> yeah. for the most ideal sequence for him to get a title shot or to take his title shot, I should say. Yeah. You know, but no. I, I just feel for my boy, you know. I I think he should have been in there, and I would have liked to see him versus Marab and see who gets to keep the jacket. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> Does he still have that jacket, or do you give it back? <laughs> <laughs> I will never tell. No, I don't know. I don't know. I don't yeah, know. one one thing I want to ask about Aljo, um, a video that we're gonna drop. I think when when this podcast airs, it will have already dropped. DJ ranks his goat mountain, so his his Mount Rushmore of MMA. Um, DJ, want to tell him what what your four were, but before we get what Aljo's MMA Mount Rushmore is. Uh, my four, I don't know by sequence. It was me, GSP, Anderson Silva, and John Jones. That was my four. I think it was either GSP. Anderson Silva, me, and then John Jones. That was the sequence I had it in. Okay. Is it my turn? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Is this thing on? <laughs> um, I, I never really thought about it. I mean, I, I have some some of my favorites. Uh, John Jones definitely up there. Um, see, the GSP Anderson Silva era... And I know I'm going to get a lot of heat for this. I respect the hell out of it. I just think it was a different time mm. where the skill level, like they were brilliant, 
unique men at that time period compared to other guys who just didn't really have the athletic ability that those guys possessed. Mm. Um, and as you can see, as time went on, father time catches up with everybody, right? And as the sport starts to evolve, some of those fights got closer and closer. A guy like Carlos Condit doesn't look like the most athletic dude, mm. but the guy can scrap. And you saw the fight with him at GSP. One moment almost changed the entire entire history book for that man and, and the, the division. So I just look at things like that because that's just how I am. I'm, I just try to be very analytical of everything. But if we're just looking at merit, looking at stats, I say it's got to be John Jones. It has to be up there. Despite even with the accusations, I, I don't know. That's not my wheelhouse. I'm not a scientist, whatever. <laughs> I, I don't know what the hell a picogram is. I don't know what that even means. I just tell it's, me if the man cheated or not. That's all I want to know. It's, <laughs> it's, it's, a picogram is if you take a, a a fine grain of salt and you throw it into a pool, a, a swimming pool. That's a picogram. That's in his system. And it's like, what? I, what does that even mean? <laughs> I, I don't. You know what I mean? Is that? Le it's, I feel like it's left up for interpretation for the viewer, where it's just like, hey, he had a picogram of this in him. Just saying. He's like, put it in a room, I'm going to walk away. <laughs> That's it. I'm like, what does that, I don't know how to interpret that. Does that mean he cheated or does that mean, like, what does that actually mean? I have no idea. Oh, so fuck. you got John Jones. Definitely, I got I got Mighty Mouse up there. Um, and then I got, if I'm going to do four, GSP and Anderson Silva. And, um, yeah, I, I think that would be my four. I feel like Hoist Gracie should even be up there. Just because, like I said, even from the time period, he was just so dominant. It's, it's kind of... Almost a little rude, but <laughs> well, I think I don't know. I, well, I think it's our time, right? Because you know, e even when we think about like you went on, like, because I, I sat here when Michael asked me, I sat here and I thought, and I was like, man, the Anderson Silva and GSP time frame was in a magnificent time frame. Those guys were more athletic, more their skill was a lot higher. I mean, if you even go back to basketball. People would say, you know, I think Michael Jordan is one of the greatest of all time. People are like, oh, no, he's not the greatest of all time. If he was around with LeBron James and Stephen Curry and today's greats, he wouldn't even be able to, he wouldn't even be, you know, you know, recognized. But I was like, you can't do that, right? It's not Michael Jordan's yeah, fault yeah. that he was way ahead of his time when he was playing. And now you have these amazing basketball players that are putting up better numbers than Michael Jordan. You can't really do that. So I think, you know, you look at the thing with Horace Gracie, there was a time when he was just being magnificent with the Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. Nobody knew what the hell he was doing. He was a small guy, no holds barred, no rules. You know, punching people in the balls, eye gouging, fish hooking, whatever it may be. The you, you know, fast forward, you go to the GSP and Anderson Silva era. You fast forward, you have my era where they're like, oh, well, if Demetrius Johnson was in the flyweight division now, he wouldn't be a champion, blah, 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 blah. And then, you know, John Jones is still doing his thing. He's still super active. So I think, you know, you're, you're not wrong. Like, and I don't think it's disrespect to Hoist Gracie, just in our time frame of us watching mixed martial arts and being in the room with these athletes, I think you're, you're, you know, what you're saying, the analytical part is absolutely right. Yeah, I, I guess I try to look at the technique and see what they're doing. I'm just like, I just feel like that shit wouldn't work right now. <laughs> <laughs> that's, how, that's how we look at like, no, no. <laughs> I, love, I love that. One thing I'd be remiss to not ask about all Joe... So you guys did meet uh, shortly after this, but but DJ, what do you think about Aljo when he was when he was uh, calling you out a little bit? Not calling you out, but just uh, talking a little bit about this hypothetical matchup. What what was uh, going through your mind when when Aljo? <laughs> I loved Aljo it. Talking that game. I loved it. I loved it. You know, it's it's good because Aljo is such a great athlete. He's so big. I even told my kids, I was like, "You see that man right there?" They're like, "Yeah." And I was like, "I would not let that mother." On my back because if he got on my back <laughs> oh my god it would be curtains it'd be it'd be lights out and you know when me and aljo met we had a i've always respected aljo and even when i was helping henry get ready for aljo and saying hey man like you got to worry about x y and z because in the, the day for me i want all athletes to make as much money as possible i am for the athletes and I think when I saw Aljo, I was like, wow, he's a lot taller than I thought he would be. And, you know, it, it was a cool guy. And I knew if we were to fight, because one championship, they asked me, they're like, hey, 
you know, who do you want to fight next? So I was like, the only fight that makes sense to me, that gets me up, that gets me hard, is fighting Aljamain Sterling. And I'm like, well, why? And I was like, because right now he's a champion over in North America. And two, he just beat Henry Cejudo. So, you know, Henry Cejudo, the Triple C, the Mystic around him, and you you took him down, you out-wrestled him. I was like, that's somebody that I think will be a fun fight. It's a tall mountain in the climb. I would love to have that fight. Um, but I love it because my name is was in his mouth and I'm not even part of the organization anymore. So I was happy about it. <laughs> I forgot what I even said. <laughs> <laughs> you said, you said, uh, I uh, I remember somebody says, oh, what do you think about uh, Demetrius Johnson? You, you're like, oh, you know what? He, he's a good guy, but he's just too f small. He's just small. I would literally just ragdoll that man. Something along those lines. No, I didn't say that. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't say that. Did I say that? I didn't say the end part. I didn't say that last sentence. <laughs> no, you was, just, it, was, it Brad, I, was it Bradley Martin? Was that the podcast where it got brought up? No, 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 no. This was... Uh, no, I think it was something before that. It was an open workout. Uh, Aljo does an open workout where he has people come to the gym, see his sexy ass, oh, yes. his chocolate muscle, yes. promote his funk harbor, <laughs> all that stuff, and then somebody asked him about it. Yeah, no, nah, they, were, they were asking me. I, I, I think I brought up the Dominic Cruz fight. I'm like... Even back then, I was like, I feel like he's very. I think I said something along the lines of like, I think, I think I said this. He's very talented, but I think we've seen in the past that when it comes to someone who's tall and lanky, it's a little bit harder, especially if they know how to wrestle. I knew you knew how to wrestle, mm -hmm. but if a, a taller, lankier guy knows how to wrestle and he has really good footwork, it's not an easy fight. I know my style is a little bit different than Dom's, but that was just more so what I was saying based on what I know from history, I guess. Oh yeah. Yeah, and that's that. You, you did say that, and I, dude, I, I hate fighting tall motherfuckers. Now I love fighting tall people, but man, like it's that's the hardest thing for me is fighting tall people because when you do wrap your arms around me, even when Dom did it, it was just a pain in the ass because you guys are bigger. I mean, when you say you walk around 170, 175, 180, I have I struggle, I struggle to keep weight on. Like I have to eat literally probably 20 to maybe 25 ounces of protein every single day just to maintain 150, 150. Like it's literally work. Like I'm sick of Jeez. eating so much food. I'm like, this is like, <laughs> this is just, it's just a lot of work. If I stop eating, like I went to Vegas and I came back home, weighed 147 and I was just going ham out there. But you know, I'm just a smaller guy, yeah. so. The, the one other thing I want to, I want to ask you this. Cause I I know uh, I felt like you were throwing a little shade my way. Okay, okay, with let's the, go, um, baby. Come on, let's get it. With the with the Piotr Jan situation. Oh yes, 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 yes. So here's my take. What I heard when it was kind of like uh, your your bit was like, you can't stall the fight, you can't play the game. But then I was kind of like, well, I, I didn't stall the fight. I took a bad shot and I was tired as hell. I was like, what you want me to do? I was like, what you want me to do, cuz? I'm trying to breathe. If he ain't going to spin behind and punch me, I'm going to take my time to breathe mm -hmm. and gather myself. So maybe he makes a mistake and I could grab his leg and take his ass down and have a Holly Holm moment with with uh, Misha Tate. Yeah. And come from behind victory and go home even though I botched my weight cut. I was like, that's what I was hoping for. And this motherfucker is just going to blast me in the head with a knee. I'm just like, yo, bro, that was not cool. Yeah. But then I felt like, you know, a little, little karma came. Yeah. Just saying. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. So I thought you were still going to go on. So here, here's my take on this. So my whole entire career of training under Matt Hume, with him going to Pride, Dream, and then now one championship. So... I had a fight when I fought John Dotson back in 2013 uh, in Chicago. John Dotson was doing the same thing that you were doing. Not necessarily the same thing, but he was playing a down opponent. He's down, he's up, he's down, he's up. So I need him in the head, and I got a warning. And I was like, dude, he's playing this game. So the reason why I said that about you is because I know your skill set. I know what you're capable of. And then when you took that bad shot and you stayed there and you kind of play that, you play that possum game where you kind of like, you sit and you're like, what you going to do, baby? You going to do something and then you get back up. You get a free opportunity where for me, I'm like, you're stalling. Stop doing that. And you are technically right. Peter Yon should have circled behind you. Henry Cejudo should have circled behind you, but they never did. So when I'm sitting there and then I see you doing that, I'm like, fuck, this guy, 
I see it as you took a bad shot, you didn't get penalized for it. Well, the opponent didn't penalize you for it, and then you got blasted in the head. Then I'm like, well, f what do you think was gonna happen? Alger, you sitting there fucking stalling the fight, you know, you got blasted. And then the thing that I loved about it, the thing that I loved about it was when I fought Ad uh, Adriano Marias, and I, well, I got dropped, <laughs> and then he need me, and then you said something on the internet, you're like, ah, ah. <laughs> You're like, ah, that's what it. I was like, oh, <laughs> that's what happens when you get up too fast. <laughs> <laughs> See, and no, uh, but no, nah. yeah, no, nah, I, I feel you. It, um, my thing is in that position because I got a lot of flack for that, even with the Sayudo fight. I'm like, guys, if I take a shot, even in wrestling, if you take a shot, you can do that. And I'm trying to finish the shot, and the guy's just stuffing the shot, but he's not trying to score or go behind, then it's just like, well. Who's actually stalling the fight if I'm being offensive and then you're just kind of looking defensively like I, I want the ref to intervene and make this more favorable for me. I'm like, well, if I took a bad shot, I'm technically in a compromised position. So why not take advantage of it? Either A, punch me, two, let me up and then strike as soon as I get up or spin behind go to the side, throw a knee to the body in turtle position. Mm -hmm. And I'm starting to see more people actually compete better in that position where now I'm like, I know for certain people, if I got to a certain position, I'm just like, I would rather pull guard than to sit and hang out there waiting for them to be dumbfounded and trying to figure out what to do. Cause I'm thinking as soon as I shoot, if you sit in that position with me, I'm like, well, one of us is going to do something wrong and hopefully it's you and I can get my reattack. Kind of like how I took down to Kei Mizuzaki yep, yep. when we fought, I shot, he stuffed the shot and he stuffed, he pushed my head back and he just looked at me. So I looked at him. <laughs> I was looking at him. He was looking at me. I was looking at him. He was looking at me. So he didn't move. He just, he kind of just looked. And I was like, all right, this is weird. Why aren't you like trying to hit me? Yeah. So then I shot a low single. I think that was the first time I ever hit a low single in a match. Mm -hmm. And I took him down. Yeah. So it was just, it's kind of like, I don't know. I feel like if I got someone there, there is no stalling the fight because I know what I would do to advance the position and take advantage of it where. I'm like, well, who's actually still in the fight? The guy who's in an advantage position and could actually punch and strike? Or the guy who can't even see where he's going because his head is planted in the mat? Yeah. Well, it, I don't know. It, no, That's no, the way I look at it. No, you're absolutely right because you're breaking the cadence. You're breaking the rhythm of a fight, right? Like, when I look at the way I fight when I fought John Dodson, when I fought Adriano Marais the second time, and when I fought Tatsuma Tawada, like, I'll go on all four and I'll kind of pray my way across the cage to them to break up the the monotony of, you know, that, that, that basic footwork trying to cross the distance, right? And I think, no, don't get me wrong, you're absolutely smart for doing that. Because if you do shoot and you and they do sprawl and then they run away from you and you stay in that crouch position, that down opponent, I think the biggest thing is that it almost puts a fight in, well, it puts the fight in a, in a situation where your opponent doesn't know what to do with it. Obviously, if I was, I would have snapped your head down. I took your back and put my triangle in. That's it. Choked, choked, choked you out. But, you know, I wasn't there. Lucky, good for you. Attempt, but attempt, <laughs> attempt, attempt, <laughs> attempt. No, but I. Funk, funk don't get choked that easy. <laughs> no, I think, I think it's very smart. But I think when I said that, um, it's very hard because, Matt, like, for me, I've dealt with so many opponents who've done that to me, and it literally drives me through the f***ing wall. Not in your position, but when they're like, oh, uh, uh, I'm playing that, uh, I'm down, yeah. you know, so, but. No, I agree with that. I agree with that. If you're going to do the up down with your hand, but if you actually take like an honest shot, then I, I, I don't feel that, I don't feel the same way towards that versus going up and down with your hand or your knee, yeah. putting your knee down and coming back up. And then it's like, all right, you're trying to draw out a, uh, different reaction for a different reason. Absolutely. Where one is more strategic. Well, I guess they're both strategical, right? Yeah, no, yeah. <laughs> I, yeah, yeah. I, I guess they're both. <laughs> well, I guess when well, you kind of think about you're it, like, it's like, uh, I, 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 no, you're right. And, and that's why I love the fact that when we, when you said that about me, I took my knee on as a grounded opponent, ate that shit. And I was like, hey, it's, it, it's part of the game, right? It's like, it's a game where I have to get used to. And then now, you know, when even when I take my bat shot in wrestling, I'll shoot and then I don't come up. They put their hand on my head. Then I take it off and I do an arm drag and get their legs. So, yes, no, it, it, it's a strategic way yeah. you did. But I felt like the way it went about and it doesn't. I mean, imagine if Peter Yan never needs you. Right. Like he he made it to a point where it, it made it look like you were stalling when you weren't stalling. I mean, now that I sit back, I mean, when I was watching that motherfucker, I felt you were stalling like a motherfucker. But 
now send it back to a strategic way and how I use that same position, not from a failed shot, but just trying to cross distance and break up the monotony. It's very strategic the way you went about it. But Peter Yan made it look like you were stalling because he just threw that knee. So, but hey, I, yeah. I ate my knee. Get over it, Ajo, okay? <laughs> <laughs> Yo, those those knees don't feel good, man. Those knees do not feel good. Shit, I didn't I didn't come to my senses till I was in the hospital. So Oh shit. Yeah, yeah shit's scary, man. Shit's scary. Uh you it's bad. Well, that was the Marlon Marais one. The one with Piotr Jan was a little different. Yeah, the but, one you did with uh Marlon uh the Marlon one, yeah, that you were you were out cold. That was a totally yeah. different shot. Totally different shot. That was yeah. You know, I always say like it didn't really happen if like if you don't remember it. So technically, <laughs> as long as I don't see the video ever again, it never actually happened. You know, uh, you know I said the same thing about when I got knocked out by Adrian. I was like, shit never happened. As long as I see off Twitter and Instagram, it'll, I'll never see it. So it never <laughs> happened. So that's why I love those two f platforms because you know, like like Dave Chappelle said, the shit don't exist if you don't go on it. <laughs> yeah. So that's right. Before we let you go, also something DJ and I like always like to do on this podcast is shouting out the YouTubes of whoever we're interviewing. And we we I know Jake Fine, he's he's very talented. He helps you out with all your YouTube content. So no, tell tell uh, our subscribers where to go, how to find you, and what what kind of content they should expect from the Funk Master YouTube channel. We got some daily training and travel vlogs and then not daily. Let me not say daily because we ain't doing it all the time. I, I got a life to live. Um, podcasting, but everything is on Funkmaster MMA, all my socials, Funkmaster MMA. Um, yeah, so people want to come check it out, get some content, some technique, all that good stuff. I'd be like, the day of learning is free nowadays, man. You can go on the interwebs and find anything. So catch me on YouTube, free 99. Mm, love that and Aljo when's the next time we're going to see you fight what obviously 2024 uh, quarter 2 quarter 3 or you try to get back into quarter 1 I'm hoping for quarter 1 I would like March like I said well actually I don't think I even said it this time but I'm getting older <laughs> man I'm getting older man like you know, I was at a point where I was trying to bang out all these fights as fast as I could obviously when you get to 5 round fights life changes a little bit so mm -hmm. It's a little bit more difficult and more challenging to stay healthy as you get older and when you get into these more competitive fights and they go the distance, it's not as easy to keep yourself together. So with that being said, I, I would hope that I could get two fights in for next year. Um, I'm chasing the 20 win club for the UFC. I think you got 20 wins in the UFC, no? Ooh, you know what? I love the title of the fences. Um, I think I only got 15, to be honest with you. I don't think I got 20. I don't think I fought for 20 times in the UFC. I got 15 right now, if I'm not mistaken. 15 and three. Mm. 15, and, yeah, 15 and four, actually. You know what's also crazy? Most of the guys, I've only had three fights where the guys weren't ranked. Damn. Everybody else was ranked that I fought. Crazy. That's 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 just shows testament to your your legacy, brother. That's all that means, man. Just you've been fighting these 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 monsters, these baddies, instead of you know guys who are on a rink, guys these who baddies. just jump. Well, you know what I mean. Uh, guys who. Hey yo. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> you're fighting these baddies, boy. Hey yo. <laughs> oh, quick question before that you go. Stem cells. You got stem cells done in your neck. How how, how do you feel about stem cells? Like I've heard so many uh, things. Like I'm gonna point now. My body's trying to break down. I'm like, man. Man, I need to do something. So I'm like, I've done PRP. I've done some stem cells, but I've never gone to like an actual stem cell facility. Like you gone to bioaccelerators, correct? Bioaccelerator was not nice, man. Top notch. Everything is like, from what I can see, it feels like state of the art, the way they treat you. And it's over in Colombia in uh, Medellin. So that was my first time doing it. I did my wrist. I don't recommend doing both wrists because then you're not going to be able to wipe your ass. Um, <laughs> My my hands were literally frozen. I was like, well, I'm going to try not to eat too much today because if I have to go to the bathroom, this is going to be miserable. Mm. Try, cause you, it, it numbs because they, they shoot it into the small little joints of your of your your, uh, your wrists. So it's almost impossible to, to put your hands straight. It's so numbing. Um, but you're supposed to keep moving it. And I can only move it if I like put it on the table and like passively <laughs> do all kinds of crazy <laughs> stuff to make it move. So, yeah, I did my shoulder, I did my neck, I did both my wrists, damn, and my bicep. And that was the main problem. And did you feel it worked? Did you feel like it felt like just PRP? Like do you do you think it was worth it? 
I never did PRP. I, I mean, it, it got me to the fight with Henry Cejudo. I, I'm always one of those guys that, like, I don't have nothing to measure it against. The pain did get less, so I feel like it did something. But it's hard to it's hard to really know because I was training full time still, mm. um, and I was trying to change my diet to a less inflammatory diet, which is you can't have red meats and things like that, which was probably the most difficult part about it. Rip. And then the other part was no alcohol whatsoever. So I went clean for that whole training camp. Damn. And yeah, I tried to give myself the best situation to win because I wanted to be, I wanted to make triple C, double C so bad. And I'm so glad I did that. <laughs> that he's, he's just not the guy you want to lose to, man, because he's just, I feel like he's a sore winner. He's a sore loser. I feel like he's both of those things. That's just my personal opinion. Uh, nice guy, but I just think he's just, I'm like, yeah, I just can't lose. I can't go home knowing I lost to this man. Well, ah, no, well, no, and I wish, I wish, I wish actually in, in hindsight that I said this at the start of the podcast, but one thing that's cool for me, um, not just sucking up to both of you, but it's pretty cool. I just thought about this an hour in, but right now we have the greatest flyweight in UFC history and the greatest bantamweight in UFC history talking to each other. So I just wanted to point that out. I thought that was pretty cool. I think, I think people would agree with that pretty undisputed. We hey. got the greatest bantamweight and the greatest flyweight. So I wanted to give you guys that, that due. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank I, you. I ain't defend my belt eleven times though. That that's that's crazy. <laughs> hey, 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 man! I was just running, man. I was trying to get this money, take care of these babies and these damn diapers. That's what I was trying to do. But she. Hey, Aljo, man, we appreciate you so much, man. Amazing. I knew this was gonna be a banger because even when we talked to each other in Vegas, it was already you know great chemistry, and I was like, man, I, I gotta have him on here. So thank you so much for taking the time out of your beautiful day. And to come on the Mighty Cast, we appreciate you. Michael, you have anything for this beautiful man? <laughs> no, no, thank you. I, I just wanted to say as as uh you know, I did work on on Henry's YouTube during a lot of that fight when when you guys had that fight and I th I thought you were always oh, a great I want to I want to kill all you guys. I want to kill oh, all right. you guys. <laughs> yeah, there's no that's there was a lot of arr, arr. a lot of stuff fight week that um definitely as all Joe, you know, was trying to make weight and and it was definitely pretty difficult on him. That's it. It doesn't get out of my skin whatsoever. This just annoys me that you guys are like this. It's so fing like hold the fuck up. Grown ass man in velour suits and shit. Like, what are you doing? What are you doing? But always you always were a professional in, in all those situations, even when it did get a little bit heated. So, yeah, no doubt. Thank you guys. All right, guys, ladies and gentlemen, that is it for the Mighty Cast. Thank you to Al Jermaine Sterling, the Benoit King, former fifth Benoit King, but one of the greatest Benoits of all time. Me and Michael are your hosts, and we are out, boys. Cheer. Well, damn. Boom. Good show there, my friends. Good show. Good show. Thank <laughs> you.